morning. Let's go ahead and open in prayer this morning. Father, we just thank you and praise you today. Because as Linda sang here in worship, we know you're faithful. We know that you never leave us. We know that you never forsake us. Daddy. Though the battle sometimes gets hot and heavy, we know that we win through you. We know that we can do all things through you. Father, I ask for your help this morning. Bring forth the word. Father, take over my mind that I'll think your thoughts. Take over my mouth that I'll speak your word. God, help us hide your word in our hearts. We ask you to have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to... How many know that? You know, I used to play basketball for Ireland High School and uh, never went to a one practice. But they had to play because they only had five players. I'm saying that because, you know, one of the things that any coach will tell you is if you're going to win games, you got to be good at the fundamentals of basketball or baseball or whatever. And the fundamentals are in basketball, dribbling, passing, you know, doing, doing the things that you got to do, the fundamentally things that you got to do. And uh, so anyways, I was uh, thinking today that I want to preach to you some fundamentals. Because, uh, you know, Jesus, he said he gave us power. And yet we don't really see the power working in the church. I don't think we see it working like it's capable of working. So, uh, you know, one of, one of the things about a coach, his uh, job is to instill confidence in his players. I mean, knows we got the best coach there is. And he, I believe he's wanting to instill confidence in you today. And we do that through the Word of God. We read the Word of God. We see what God says. And, and it builds our confidence up to where, uh, uh, you know, there's been a, a many a team that maybe wasn't as talented as other teams, but they still won the game. And it was because it was because the coach instilled confidence in them to where they was able to play above their ability. And I believe today, church, that God is wanting to instill confidence in you so you can play. Not that this is a game, this is life. It's not really a game, but that you can I'm using the, the game as a, as a way of explaining this. He's wanting to build confidence in you to where you will play beyond your capabilities. How many knows God's able to do that? He's able to instill confidence in you, give you confidence to face what you're facing and, and uh, to where you can do things that you didn't think you, it was possible for you to do, but you will be able to do that. One of the things that, that I was, uh, I've actually, this is something that I've been kind of, uh, I guess, examining myself about, and that is that uh, I, I want to see God's power work in this community. I want to see people delivered. I want to see people uh, saved. I want to see people healed. Whatever, you know, sometimes the greatest healing that you could have is in your mind. You know, there's people that are troubled in their minds. They, they have things going on in their minds. And, and uh, 
I believe God's even able to heal our minds and give us peace in our mind. And so anyways, I just want to, this morning, it not, might not be a real fiery message, but it's going to be about the fundamentals that I see some of the fundamentals of giving, getting the power back in the, in the church. And one of the things, you know, is that if, if we think that God is not working in a way that He is capable or wanting to work, then we have to admit that to ourselves. We have to admit that, hey, we're lacking something here. And then if you admit, come to that place where you admit that you're lacking something, then you can start asking. And I want to go to James in uh, chapter 1 and verses uh, 5 through 8. And uh, again, this is just uh, some of the fundamentals that uh, we're going to lay out, principles. Just want you to be able to know for sure that we can go to God and we can ask Him. Uh, James chapter 1 and verses 5 through 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing waver. For he that wavered is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So we see that the scripture tells us that if we lack wisdom, we're to ask of God. We're to go to God and ask Him. So hey, if, if we don't understand why the power of God is not working in our lives and in the church's life as much as it ought to, I mean, that was the first thing we ought to do is ask God. Amen? That's a fundamental, isn't it? It's a fundamental thing here that the first thing if we have something going in on in our lives and we don't understand it and we don't know what's going on and, and uh, the first thing we need to do is start talking to God and ask God, hey God, I said that, hey God, that uh, reminded me of a, a book I read years ago. Anybody ever read that book, hey God? It uh, was a, it's kind of getting off my message, but yet it's not either. I think it's right on actually. The, the title of the book was Hey God and it was a little Italian woman it was, her son was writing the book but uh, this little Italian woman was raised I believe it was a Catholic and anyways uh, somebody come to her door knocked on her door and started witnessing to her about the Holy Spirit and of course she had never heard that before and didn't know anything about it so after they left she went up into her bedroom and she calls out, she says, Hey God, is this true? <laughs> she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Right. And uh, anyways, to make, I guess, I don't want to take it on too long here, but she, uh, every time she had something with God that she didn't understand, she'd go up to her bedroom and holler, Hey God! What about this? And God just done miraculous things in her life. And, and uh, she got her kids and they went up and down the street and started witnessing the people and got people saved. I mean, just, it's unbelievable what was going on there. Uh, she started getting invited to meetings to speak. And uh, I mean, God was using her, you know. But her simple thing was, hey God, what's, what's this about? What's going on here? Listen, church, sometimes we need to come to that simple place. Hey, God, what are you doing here? Hey, God, what don't I understand? So the first thing that we need to do is we need to start going to God and talking to God. Hey, God, why is this power not in our church and in our lives like it needs to be? And... Uh, so we, we go to God and we begin to ask Him for the wisdom. We be, how many knows that uh, in the scripture it said that uh, if you ask for bread, He'll not give you a stone. So one of the fundamental things with God, this is a fundamental thing like in basketball, dribbling, passing. It's a fundamental thing. One of the fundamental things with God is to go to Him and talk to Him. Ask Him. He, he's way wiser than I am. He's way wiser than your neighbor. He can give you things that you need to know. 
I also, uh, while we're in James, I want to go to uh, chapter 4. And uh, verses 2 and 3. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain because you fight and war. Yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So we see again, he's, he's talking to us, says, you have not because you ask not. So one of the fundamental things in the scriptures is to ask God, to begin to ask him, what's going on? Hey God, fill me in on this. I need some wisdom. I need some understanding. And, and uh, we, we go to God and we, one of the things in this scripture, and I think this is uh, uh, one of the, also, uh, maybe a reason that we don't see the power of God working in our lives, and it, it talks about it, said in the last part of verse uh, 3, that you may consume it upon your lust. And I think many times that that's a, a reason sometimes that God does not give the power to us that we want because we're in such a state that we would consume it upon our lust. I mean, know sometimes, you know, we are human people. And it's natural for human people to lust for power. And sometimes God has to give us understanding about how to use power and sometimes he can't give us power because we're not in a place where we would use it justly. But we would use it in a way that would satisfy our lusts. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We would use the power of God to satisfy our lusts. And how many knows God's not going to let us do that? He's not going to give us power for us to satisfy our lust. So one of the things we must be always looking for in us is that if God begins to give us the power that we begin to know that we cannot use it just to satisfy our lust. We have to use it. See, Jesus, he said that uh, whatever he did, he said, I always hear from my Father. And I, I wouldn't do anything that I didn't hear from my father because he, I think he realized that he needed to hear these things from his father. And if Jesus needed to hear it from his father, how many know we for sure need to hear it? Amen? And so as, as God begins to give his people the power of God, he also is going to begin to expect his people to use it properly in a way that would bring Him glory and honor and not satisfy our lusts. I want to go to uh, St. Matthew. This is actually something that I was uh, reading this week. Or not, I don't know if it was this week or... And it kind of shocked me when I read it, but it opened up something to me. Chapter uh, 17... Matthew chapter 17. In verses 19 and 21. And this is where the, uh, Jesus had sent out the disciples and told them to uh, heal the sick and do different things. And, and uh, they came back and uh, they were not able to heal this one, this guy had brought his son to him and they wasn't able to heal his son. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, let me go back. Well, let me just, uh, this, this the man is telling Jesus, he said, and I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. 
Then Jesus said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very time, from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Okay, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, they said, Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have the faith as a grain of a, a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, be, it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. It. How be it, this kind go without, but by prayer and fasting. Okay, now let's let's examine this. He said, because Jesus said, the disciples said, why couldn't we cast out this demon or this devil or whatever you want to call it? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. And then as we read down through the scripture, he says, this kind, so the reason they wasn't able to cast this out was because they had unbelief, right? And so Jesus, uh, later on he says, this kind comes out by only by prayer and fasting. Why was they to use prayer and fasting? Because of their unbelief. It's right there in the scriptures. It's very plain. See, he said, he said, the disciples said, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said, here's the reason that you couldn't cast him out. It was because you had unbelief. And then he says, this kind is, in other words, he said, I'm going to tell you how to get rid of this, this kind. He said, it only comes out by prayer and fasting. Why wasn't they able to cast him out? Because of unbelief. How were they going to do it? By prayer and fasting, that's going to build up their faith. Amen? To where they can do, in other words, if, if we pray and fast, it will build up our faith to where we can speak to that evil spirit and get him out of people's lives. So, it wouldn't hurt us to do a little praying and fasting. Especially praying, but I believe fasting too. And the reason is it will help build up our faith. Amen? So that when we come up against some devil or something, that we could speak to it and it would depart. So it's by prayer and fasting. Now listen, I don't want you to take this to an extreme. How many knows that everything the scripture says for us not to lean too far to the right or too far to the left because you get out of balance. Now there are been there have been people that have fasted enough that they've hurt their physical body. That's not what we're talking about here. Amen. But it's good to pray and fast. So I, I just want to caution you. And let me say this to you also. You're not going to... You know, I've had people say, Well, you want God to do this for you? Pray and fast. And God will do it for you. Listen, if the only reason you're praying and fasting is for God to do something for you, there's a good chance that He might not do it. But if you pray and fast for God to build up your faith, how many knows that's a good thing? You're never going to go wrong by building up your faith. I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying is if you pray and fast, make sure that you're not doing it to try to control God. God's not going to be controlled. I'm not going to control Him. In other words, I want Him to do this. I'm going to pray and fast and He's going to do that. No, that's not the way it works. You see, I pray and fast until my faith is built up, until the place where I can understand what God's will is 
for this situation. Amen? Does that make sense? It's a fundamental, isn't it? Just like dribbling. It's a fundamental. So, I'm just trying to encourage you today. <clears throat> you know what I want? I want for you to have victory in your life. Amen? I want you to have victory in your life. And so, for lack of a better way of saying it, I want you to win the game. And how many knows that the coach will drill these players and drill these players and drill these players on the fundamentals of the game? Because when they get in the game, he wants them to do that just because they're, they've been doing it all week in practice and it's a part of them and they're just going through the motions and they don't have to think about it, but it's a part of it. I want you to get some of this stuff in your spirit to the place that when you face life, it's just a part of you. And it just begins to work in you and, and, and uh, you begin to grow in God and your faith begins to grow stronger and all of a sudden you're seeing yourself, for lack of a better way, playing above your ability. Amen. I want to go, uh, this is, uh, I want to kind of show you an a illustration in the Bible where I think we're uh, talking about some of the things that I'm talking about here with you today. I want to go to Judges in uh, chapter 6 and verses 11 through 16. This is about Gideon. I got to tell you, don't have nothing to do with my message, really. But uh, when I was young in the Lord, I started reading about Gideon. And I'll tell you, it charged me up. Man, this Gideon. And for months, that's about all I talked about was Gideon. And I read and studied it a lot. And I want to go to uh, verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the oak, which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joas the Azmarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Now I want you to see the Midianites, they were stealing everything from God's people. Whenever they planted a crop, they would come in and steal their crop. They were like coons. Amen. Now let me tell you about a coon. He can find sweet corn wherever you put it. And he'll get it the night before you pick it. Because he knows that's when it's ready. And for some reason they know, right? You know, I was talking to this guy over in Illinois. And he had an 80 acre field out there. And so he was going to hide his sweet corn from his coons. So he went out in his 80 acre field and he planted his sweet corn right in the middle of this 80 acre field. And he said, you know what? They didn't bother none of the other corn, but they found my sweet corn. <laughs> and he said, I was going to go out there to, the next day and harvest it. And he said, they got it that night. See them, them coons, they know when to get your sweet corn. And these Midianites, they were like coons the, the God's people would plant their crop and, and before they could harvest it, they would go out there and steal it from them to the point that God's people didn't have nothing to eat and were being robbed. How many know that the devil a lot of times robs us? But the things that God would give us, he robs us. And, and so Gideon, he's... he's He's hiding and he's threshing out this wheat and he's hiding because he don't want the Midianites to see. You see what state he's in? He's in a beat down state. He's in a state where he uh, can't hardly believe that God could do anything in his life. And I want you to know sometimes, church, 
you can get in that state. You can get beat down to the place where you think that God won't ever do anything in your life. I'm telling you, that's a, that's a lie from the devil. He's trying to rob you. He's trying to keep you from having God's blessings in your life. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord... Listen to what Gideon said. Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told of us of saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherein shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midians as one man. I want you to know, church, you can get into a state where you are beat down so low that you don't think God's with you anymore. This is the place where Gideon was. He was beat down to that place where he didn't think that God was with him. And I want you to know what happened when he heard what God said to him. Amen? How many knows Gideon went on to win the, the battle? An impossible battle to win. Listen, I was telling you that God can make you play better than your possible, than possible, than your abilities. God can make you play better than your abilities. I want you to know God can cause you to do some miraculous things in your life. He can cause you to be a better person than you are capable of being on your own. Okay, I want to go to uh, Luke and chapter 10. I've got a lot of scriptures today. And the reason I got them is because I want these fundamentals to get down in you and take root. Luke chapter 10. In verses 19 through 20. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. He said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents. You know what happens when we get in a situation where we can't see what God's doing and we can't see and understand how He could ever deliver us? We forget about that God gave us the power to overcome. Can I say it like this? We forget about the fundamentals of passion. We forget about the fundamentals of dribbling. And we look at the <coughs> opponent and we see the opponent as a giant, if you will, bigger than us, better than us. How many knows there was a little boy And there was a giant. 
And he had the whole army of Israel backed up. And they were all afraid of him. But there was a little boy that came. And he said these words. He said, is there not a cause? In other words, he said, why are you letting this Philistine defile you? Defy you, I'm sorry, defy you. Do you not know that you are the army of God? He said, I'll go out there and face him. Because I know that God will be with me. And he went out there. And how many knows that he played beyond his capabilities? I want to say to you today, church, I don't care what you're going through. You've got to remember that God gave you power. I don't care what situation you're facing. I don't care how bleak it looks. I hate to preach this because I might have to face it tomorrow. Amen. I don't care how bleak it looks. I don't care what the situation is. You must understand that God's given you power. <coughs> You must understand you're not in this alone. You must understand that I think Linda spoke of it this morning. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Man. I wonder how Jonah felt when he was in the belly of the whale. Do you think that maybe he felt like God might have deserted him? Amen? I don't know about you, but if I was in the belly of a whale, I'd kind of wonder where God was, wouldn't you? God, where are you at in this? Maybe he was far enough along spiritually that he didn't wonder that. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you God hadn't left him. He may have been in the whale of a belly. He may have been in the belly's way of the whale. Amen. Did I get it right? He may have been in the belly of the whale. But God hadn't left him. God hadn't forsaken him. God still had a plan for his life. <coughs> Do you know sometimes in life we can get to a place where we don't have no plan for our life anymore? Because everything we everything we planned seemed like it went wrong. You ever been there? I've been there. I got to a place where I didn't want to make decisions anymore because it seemed like every decision I made ended up being the wrong one. But I'm here to tell you, sometimes them wrong decisions are the right decisions. Because they move us where we need to be moved. They take us where we need to go. Hey, this good preaching. I know because I've been there. I, I'm not saying it's good preaching because I'm preaching it. I'm saying it's good because of what's going on. You can know that God is with you. You can rest assured. I want to say this to you this morning. You can rest assured that God has not lost his power. Behold, 
I give unto you power to tread on serpents and in scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Church, I'm convinced that we do not understand the power that's in us. I'm convinced of this. And, and I've, I've spent several hours pounding this because Jesus said, I give you power. I believe the whole problem is we don't think we got the power. Amen? I think that's the problem. We, we don't understand that we got this power in us. And our faith is like the disciples. They couldn't cast this, this spirit out because of their unbelief. And church, it's because of our unbelief, I think, Our unbelief in, in the power that's in us. Do you wonder how much that must hurt God? For him to, through Jesus, to give you power and for us to not realize that we have this power and not use this power. It must hurt God. Because it's available. And, and listen, he sees his children struggling and going through these things. And not that struggling. Sometimes we got to struggle. But listen, don't forget. Just because you're struggling doesn't mean the power is not there. Amen? And I think it will change not only our lives, but the world that we live in, if we can come to the place that we understand, no matter what we're going through, no matter what's happening in our lives, God's power is still there. And we need to keep looking for that power to manifest itself. I want to go to uh, Matthew chapter 10. And verses uh, 19 through 20. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, 7 through 8. Chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. And as you go preaching, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Heal the sick, cast, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, Freely you have received, freely give. I don't know about you, but that power, I haven't recognized it in my life to that extent. That doesn't mean it's not there. Remember, Jesus said, I give you power. So the power is there. to do these things. The power is there. We need to be talking to the Lord, don't we? We need to be saying, God, hey God, hey God, what's going on here? Why is this power not present? I was praying this week and I said, God, what is separating me from you in this? What is separating us? What is holding us back? Something is not there. Something, somehow we're going to have to ask God and get a revelation from God of why 
this power is not present in our lives. See, church, we can come to church every Sunday. But what is it doing in our life? What is it changing in our life? I'll say this to you today, church. Multitudes of people are going to church every Sunday and not having a relationship with God. You know how I can say that? Because I did it for years. I went to church every Sunday and I was in my 20s before somebody told me you can have a personal relationship with God. It's the first time I ever heard that. Well, I don't know if it's the first time I ever heard it. I will say it's the first time I heard it. I may have heard it before that, but you understand what I'm saying? But it is the first time that I heard it. In other words, it's the first time that it registered in my mind that you can have a personal relationship with God. But there are multitudes of people going to church every Sunday and not experiencing the presence of God and not having a personal relationship with Him. And listen, church, we can be going to church every Sunday and even have a personal relationship with God and not have the power of God in our lives. Not that it's not there. See, I could always have a personal relationship with God anytime I wanted to. All I had to do was confess my sins and accept Jesus as my Savior. And I have a personal relationship with God, right? It was always there. And it's the same way with the power of God. It's always there. It's up to us to accept it and hear about it and know it. And I don't understand it all. I wish I could stand up here today and say, here's the formula. You do this, this, and this, and the power of God will be in your life. I don't have that formula, but I do know this. The power of God is available. And not only is it available, it's also yours. He's done already gave it to you. And I can take you back to another scripture, and it says... Behold, I give you peace. And how many people in the world don't have peace? And yet God said he gave them peace. I remember one day myself, I was working at the job. And I was thinking about that. It said, Behold, I give you peace. And I said, God, if you gave me peace, where is it? Because I don't have it. But you know what? I started pounding that scripture. Behold, I give you peace. And after about a month or two, I understood something. And it was real simple. If God gave me peace, and I don't have peace, that means somebody robbed it. Amen? It means somebody robbed me of my peace that God gave me. And how many knows the power of God can be the same way? God has given us power. His scripture says, Behold, I give you power. And he's given us power. And yet we don't have this power in our life. If we don't have this power in our life, it's not because God didn't give it. It's because we don't have it. That means somebody robbed it from us. How does Satan rob us of our power? By telling us, God's not going to do nothing there. He's not going to do this. He's not going to do that. I'm going to go to Mark chapter 16. Verses 15 through 18. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but him that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak in new tongues. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. Now let's go to... Uh, I want to go to 1 Corinthians in uh, chapter 4 and verses 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And then with that, uh, I'm going to go also to uh, 2 Corinthians. Two, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 2 through 5. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He said He didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom. What did he come in? In demonstration of the spirit and of power. You know what church? Too many times we have all the words in the world. We can, we can tap the talk. We can, we can act the act and talk the talk. But where's the demonstration of the power? Amen. Where's the demonstration of the power? He said, he said, he didn't come to, to him with words of wisdom, but he came unto them in demonstration of the spirit and of power. How many knows we need the demonstration of the power? Amen. You can hear all the, all the talk you want to hear, but I'm telling you, it's where the rubber meets the road is in the demonstration of the power of God. I've got one more scripture yet. I don't want to go to Thessalonians. Chapter 1 and verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. It said, Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. I say to you today, church, we need the power of God in demonstration in our lives and in our churches. I just, I don't know, I may uh, go on with this message some more, I'm not sure, but I want to say to you today, church, it's imperative that we begin to ask God, where's the power and demonstration in our lives, in our church's lives? Now I want to say something to you in, in respect to power in the church. I'm convinced to have power in the church, it must come through the body of Christ. And that each and every one of us got a place in the body of Christ. Listen. 
if I try to do something in the natural realm and my whole body don't get into it, if I'm going to pick something up, which takes a little power to pick it up, then it takes my whole body working together. I have leg muscles working, I have hand muscles working, my brain is even working, telling me what to do. It takes the whole body working together. And so I think in, to have power in the church, I believe it has to come through the body, that the body has to work together. And uh, in fact, in the matter, we read the one scripture where it talks about, it says, you're uh, warring and doing this and doing that, and you're having all kinds of things, but you know, you're not having the presence of God. And so the body has to come together. Now let me paint you a picture a little bit of the body of Christ. <laughs> If you think that I'm perfect because I'm in the body of Christ, that's wrong. I'm not a perfect person. I have faults. But if I'm part of the body, somehow you have to be able to accept that. That I'm not perfect. That yet I'm a part of the body. Let me liken it to this. My children are part of my family. They don't always do what I think they ought to do. Does that make them any less part of my family? No, they're still part of my family. The picture I'm trying to point to you to, out today to you to, is this. If you think because people are in the body of Christ that they're perfect, that's, that's not right. Not everybody's, nobody's perfect. And so if the body's going to have to come together for the power of God to work, we'll also have to understand each one of us has areas where we need God's help. And I'll also say this, if the body is truly working together and the power of God is in demonstration in our church, you'll see them parts of the body being touched. They'll be ministered to, they'll be touched, they'll be delivered, there'll be uh, things in the body will happen that you won't even be able to explain. And I want to uh, go on ahead and uh, stop there. I want, I want you to take this with you today. That you begin to seek after God. You begin to ask him, hey God, where is this power that you're talking about? How many knows if we'll ask God, he'll give us a revelation? He'll reveal himself to us. But that's the part we seek after him. He said, knock, and the door will be open. Seek, and you will find. And as we begin to knock, hey God, what's going on here? I believe God will begin to minister to, to the body. And we'll begin to have understanding. You know, most of the time, we, Linda usually plays a little song, and she had to leave early today, so we won't have a, have no uh, have her available to play a song. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just pray in closing. Father, I pray a blessing on each and every person that's here today, Father. That you will bless them, Father. Just bless their coming in, bless their going out, Father. Just reveal yourself to us. Father, we want to know about the power that you've given us. We want to know about the demonstration of the power and of the Spirit of God. We ask for revelation knowledge, Father. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.